episode of AI Chronicles, everyone. Uh, with the rise in AI applications and the research as we see every day, I have been seeing a rise in such communities as well, whether it is communities for AI developers, AI beginners, founders, women in tech, and so on. I invited my friend Grishma, who is not only an accomplished data scientist, but a great community-spirited individual, especially in the communities which are encouraging women's representation in tech and so much more. Hi, Grishma. How are you doing? Hi, Sonam. I'm well. Thank you so much for inviting me. How are you doing? I'm um, doing pretty well. Pretty excited to have you here. And, you know, it's always nice to run into you in the SF events every now and then. Um, yeah. It's like we have become the uh, community friends or the events friends. We see each other uh, uh, in these kinds of conferences. Absolutely. Um, I think going to an event is incomplete if I don't see you there. So I always keep wondering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm curious, are there any other events in your agenda that either you are hosting or speaking at or even attending? Yeah, uh, that's funny you ask because I am hosting the second iteration. So this is my second year running a women in data science regional event. Um, IBM is sponsoring it and we're going to have it on 30th October in San Francisco. So really looking forward to that. Oh, that's awesome. Great. Okay. Uh, I will, you know, RSVP and hope to see you there. Uh, great. Okay. So, um, you know, you, I have seen your journey, uh, at least on LinkedIn and what we have spoken. And I've seen, uh, heard you give talks on data science uh, in many different, on many different platforms. So, but why don't you tell us about your data science journey? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll go back a little bit even further uh, beyond when I started working. Um, mm -hmm. So I always, so I'm guessing since, you know, we're from India, uh, for us, we start learning computer science at an earlier age, which is part of the school curriculum, which I think is fantastic, amazing mm -hmm. things. So I think I started getting my first exposure to programming probably in the seventh grade. And from seventh grade to 12th grade, we learned Java. So this was like hardcore programming language. And obviously that was like really, really popular back then, right? Um, and during this time, I recognized that I really love the idea of critical thinking and, you know, writing some code to do some other objective. And uh, specifically, I really liked those patent finding programs or patent printing programs. Yeah. Like, you know, you draw a star that's yes, in the shape yes, of a pyramid. The pyramid. Yep, yep. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to have a Nostalgic. lot of fun writing the pseudo code. Yep, I yeah. know this is like down memory lane. Yeah. Um, so that's when I realized, okay, you know, I really enjoy computer science as, you know, as a subject. What if I were to at least, you know, study that formally as a computer science or engineering degree and then take it from there. So uh, did that, did my undergrad. And um, funnily enough, my degree was formally called computer science and engineering, which I guess mm -hmm. is kind of a combination of both. Um, and then I realized, okay, you know, this is interesting. Four years wasn't enough. I think I wanted to do grad school and, you know, on a master's in this. So that's so when I came here, um, again, continued computer science with a lot of focus on AI, ML, data science, all of the good stuff, because by then I realized that this is the, you know, the uh, sub focus that uh, the subfield that I want to focus on. Um, so I started doing that. And after that is when I ended up with IBM as a data scientist in their commerce division in a marketing team. So this was more of a centralized team that used to, you know, do things like analyze marketing data, trying to run predictive ad campaigns and um, dynamic pricing. So a lot of different things related to the marketing domain. So I did that for about two years. And then um, a vice president of design reached out to me and said, hey, we have the need for a data scientist, but we haven't really ever recruited a data scientist in our org because this is just, you know, design and user research. Uh, but I'm sure we need one because there's so many sources of data that we're not really utilizing. And we feel like it would be so much more powerful if somebody who understands the data can identify the opportunities where we can leverage that and make an impact. Um, so that, that was really the only job description. So I went in, I said, yes, sounded like an interesting challenge. And that's where I've been um, in sort of 
wearing different hats, a little more on the operations side or trying to do competitive analysis for product managers or analyzing survey data for user researchers and just really sort of focusing on that triangulation of, hey, you have qualitative data, great, but here's quantitative data. Let's mix the two and let's you know see what the bigger picture represents. Um, yeah, and then I guess now, I guess my team is called product excellence office, which is the org. So we're focusing on how to enable other teams to become more successful, whether that's through um, instrumenting the right data, looking at that and, and looking that and analyzing data, or even just planning of, you know, hey, how can we make sure that even if we don't collect that data, you know, today, six months down the line, what are the questions we would need answering to? And just enabling and empowering teams around that. Nice, nice. Um... I, so how, how long have you been working at IBM? Uh, it's been more than seven years now. Nice. And do you enjoy it? Yeah, I think uh, the sort of role I have is very unique. Nobody else in the entire company has this data scientist sitting at, you know, user research, design, Hi. PM intersection. Um, and as you probably know, I love public speaking. So I love that enablement component as well, which I get to do with this role. You know, so I don't remember where we met, how we met, literally no uh, memory of that. But um, I remember you hosted a women specific event at your office in San Francisco. Last year, yeah. And it was last year, right. So I attended that and the way you spoke and hosted the event, it just it just stayed with me. I'm like, huh. I'm going to take notes from this woman. She is amazing at public <laughs> speaking and, you know, she knows what she's talking about. So I was like, okay. And since then I had like, okay, you know, every time if you speak, I'm going to take a look at it and, you know, take notes. Okay, this is how I want to do it. These are the good things and, you know, how I can improve. So very inspiring to say the least. Thank um, you. And that's very kind of you, yeah, Sonam. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned in your introduction, uh, you have been doing a lot of community uh, stuff as well. So why don't you tell us about your community experience, especially building women in data science communities? Yeah, so I will start off with saying this was probably three-ish years ago now. Um, I was talking to a colleague at IBM who was uh, visiting from outside of San Francisco and I told her, hey, you know, there are so many meetups happening and it's it's great, but I don't see that happening a lot in our office. And this was like right after the pandemic had, you know, started um, dying down and people were coming into the office. And I said, and sometimes I really feel like, you know, there needs to be a community that specifically is for women or, you know, the minorities in tech because... You know, Sonam, right? Any meetup you go to San Francisco, it's it's going to be very male dominated. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, can we can we do something about that? And um, she is actually uh, very good friends with uh, with the people who started the Women in Data Science organization at mm -hmm. Stanford. And she told me, hey, there's this global nonprofit, Women in Data Science, and they actually are looking for ambassadors. And uh, it's sort of a yearly thing where you can become an ambassador, you can host datathons, hackathons, um, regional events, and just sort of, you know, mobilize that effort in very grassroots led sort of movement. So they have ambassadors all across the um, world in different countries and they sort of just do their own local events so that mm -hmm. everyone gets that exposure. Um, and I said, okay, that sounds like what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm not 100% confident, but let me take a look at it. And I just took that, you know, leap of faith. Um, and even at IBM, I am the co-chapter lead for our California chapter of what is what was then called as Academy of Technology. It is now called Open Innovation Committee. Um, so it's just IBM's way of making sure that we are, you know, getting um, access to more knowledge. We are upskilling ourselves and just, again, having sort of those events to really empower the community. So as part of that role and, you know, being an ambassador for women in data science, that sort of went hand in hand because now I had that, you know, internal support as well as, you know, that external uh, need for hosting events. And that's where I took a leap of faith and I organized my first ever event. So been to a lot of events, spoken at a lot of events, not really organized an event. 
Um, so that's what, that was the first event that uh, that you attended, Sonam, that we had last mm-hmm. year. And I really felt that there is one, a need to celebrate women who are doing mm-hmm. amazing in this field. We know that there are so many challenges for women in tech that are very unique, you know, to being underrepresented minorities. Um, so one was just giving them that sort of, you know, stage and celebrating their work. Um, second was inspiring other people to see that, hey, we are celebrating somebody who looks like you, who speaks like you, who exactly. is probably coming from a background like you. If yeah. they can do it, you can too. And the third one was just that community aspect of, you know, feeling like you have that support system, feeling like, you know, you have people that are maybe going through similar things, because mm-hmm. oftentimes a lot of the struggles that we face in, in the industry, whether in tech or outside, we have the sense of guilt or shame of I'm the only one going through this. I don't want to burden my friends about yeah. this. And also, like, you know, something's wrong with me because I am the one, you know, who's facing this obstacle, not knowing very well that somebody sitting right next to us could be going through that exact same thing or having been through that exact same thing, you know, maybe two years ago. So Mm -hmm. I just wanted to sort of, you know, get that sense of community of, hey, this is a safe space where we can learn from each other, we can share with each other, and we are there to guide along um, each other on their paths as well. So that was how I started, you know, sort of focusing more on that women in tech events. And I think around the same time or probably a few months later, I was also um, made aware of Society of Women Engineers, which is, again, Mm -hmm. a national nonprofit for women in tech. And they were uh, looking for uh, somebody as part of their leadership team. So I applied, I joined in, and I think I've been now their communications chair for probably three-ish years And Mm -hmm. as part of that also, again, same objective, let's organize events for women in tech and again, empower them and um, do a lot of outreach to students, to schools as well, to again, show them that, hey, you do belong in this industry. So that's been sort of, uh, you know, my motivation and uh, the sort of work I've done so far. I knew there was a reason why, you know, I wanted to talk to you about this. It's (laughs) because the thoughts, the the things you said are exactly what I feel it as well. And the reason why you know, um, I started this podcast as well. I wanted to bring that ratio, uh, like a balance in that ratio, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I totally resonate with what all you say. So speaking of, like you mentioned, that we see a lot of male domination in all these events. And yes, I find it, uh, what's the word? It's, It's amusing in a way, like how is it always just that? So yeah. uh, do you see that unbalanced representation of men and women in like in general in tech industry, not only the events in SF uh, mm-hmm. particularly, but and if you see that unba- uh, the, the unbalanced uh, representation, mm-hmm. can you share any reason that might have might have caught your eye why there is that uh, unbalance or disbalance, whatever? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I I definitely see that. And that was really interesting because when I was doing my undergrad in India, our class Mm -hmm. was 50% women, 50% men. So I grew up thinking that, yeah, you know, there's there's parity in the system, like, you know, women go in tech, women are in engineering, and that's, that's what's acceptable. That's the norm. So it didn't really strike me as, you know, this is actually something good that's Mm -hmm. not normal. And then I came here to the US and um, I sort of saw that women were the minority. And that to me was like, this doesn't feel right. And why is this happening? And I mean, I don't think you can point a finger to any one specific factors. Mm -hmm. It starts off with like, right in school are, you know, are girls getting access to the same level of education as far as, you know, let's say robotics club or STEM Mm -hmm. education. Um, Is that happening? Do they have access and do they have, um, you know, supportive uh, adults who are, you know, encouraging them to go try that out, even if they're going to fail at it, or they're going to be terrible at it, you know, just give them enough time to really nurture their talents and their interests. and then I think coming to the universities, again, do you really have that support system or that community? Um, sometimes, you know, you can have uh, really sexist people in, in your path, whether that's your peers or, you know, the education education uh, folks that you encounter. So, again, I think you sort of lose that motivation or start questioning yourself of, do I belong here? And if I do belong, am I even worth it? Mm-hmm. And just sort of, you know, a lot of self-doubts. 
Um, and then I think coming in the coming into the corporate world uh, or even in academia, we again don't see people who look like us, who sound like us, who have the same backgrounds as us. And again, that just sort of feeds into that whole self doubt and lowering of confidence of I don't think I'm good enough. And then as further you go in your career, right, um, not having access to let's say parent parental leave, maternity leave, or not having the right source of resources for when you return to work um, to make sure that you know you feel like like you're skilled enough and you feel like, you know, you can take care of um, your family without sacrificing on work or you can be, you know, uh, going into work without feeling like you're abandoning your family. So I think it's 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 a lot of social issues, a pipeline issue, an access education issue. There are just so many factors we have to overcome. Mm. And even after all this happens, right, um, I think I was reading a statistic the other day that says a lot of a majority of women well, I can't remember the number, but a significant number of women drop out of tech before they turn 35 because they have faced so many challenges. They're like, you know what, this isn't worth it. I'm just going to go off and do something on my own or become, you know, um, go focus on the family 100 percent or just do something, you know, that doesn't mm. have to keep them feeling like they're in a battle constantly. Damn, that's a, a little shocking. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so the kind of community building events that you do, do you think like, or, you know, any specific kind of community uh, building events that help encourage women to participate or show in public to show, uh, like to share their cool work that they are doing? Mm -hmm. Are there any like specific kinds of such events that you think uh, have been successful over the time? Yeah, that's interesting you asked that because I think one sort of event that usually has been very successful is anytime there's a women tech focused event, there are people, there are women, there are minorities that are flocking to that event and the room is filled with them to the point of it makes you wonder, wow, I didn't even know so many women in San Francisco were going to yes. these events because yes. you never see them at the normal at the normal events, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I so, think any sort of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. And I was just like, I always wondered about this because I have attended these events, one of which yeah. was, was yours. And I always wondered, like, OK, so you go like women show up in the women specific events. Yeah. What happens? What is stopping them to go to the normal events yeah. where everybody is coming? So I, yeah. have you figured out the reason for that? Because I'm um, still wondering. Yeah, I think. I think at least for some women, it's almost like by default at the women focused event you are guaranteed a safe supportive space where you feel like you know you can be yourself you don't have to like you know put up appearances or put up a pretense um i think it was just uh, last year right grace hopper conference and i realized that that just is going now there was so many so much controversy about you know women not not like in the career fair i heard that they weren't getting the right of way and people would just come and push them and it would be very aggressive behavior yeah like read up there was a statement sent out by the organizers as well so i think I feel if women feel that, you know, going to a, again, we're going to call it a quote normal event, mm -hmm. probably doesn't guarantee them that sense of safety or that sense of supportive community. And they might feel like it needs to be an aggressive battle and, you know, just being all alpha over there and being like, hey, I'm the best. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I am the one that needs all the attention. I don't know if that's, you know, for, for some women. Um, I've also heard for from quite a few people I know that, they don't feel um they don't feel like they can go to an event on their own so if they have friends or they have people they know coming with them at the event that again just sort of is like you know again another safety blanket mm -hmm. um so i think at least for making women more comfortable and having them open up and having them be you know really honest and transparent having those women focused events really help but what we might be doing in that scenario is also not letting men hear the sort of, you know, exactly. issues that women have. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. let's have those safe, supportive spaces for women and non-binaries. But let's also make sure that slowly we start to get allies and supporters in those spaces so that yes. they can hear that this is not just something they read in books or in media mm -hmm. articles. It's happening to the women they work with, the women they live yeah. with, the women they are friends with and, you know, just yes. people that they gently interact with. And it's not like some removed from reality thing happening.
happening in you know some other world in some other space where they don't know anything about it yeah you know you you just read my mind i always believe that men could be the most supportive and encouraging towards women and once they do that that ba- the ratio imbalance is going to get balanced automatically so that's what i feel so um yeah i, I think we need to start like you know the normal events and the women specific events i think we need to start joining them uh slowly and steadily so mm-hmm. that this issue goes away uh, at some yeah. point soon uh okay so pivoting a little bit uh what is your process for preparing to do any kind of public speaking uh, well not any kind but mainly like technical technical mm-hmm. talks mm. what's your process yeah like? so um because for me i have spoken at a lot of events i usually have some sort of a template or a foundational deck of hey or even just like an outline of hey these are the topics that i love to talk about or these are the topics where i feel people aren't really getting a lot of access to this you know topic or there's not a lot of um talk going on in the general you know population about this um so that i start off with having you know that sort of outline of this is what i want to talk about this is what i think people need to hear people in the industry need to hear or this is a unique you know perspective on xyz topic so starting off with that uh, with that um, outline is really important um when it comes to preparing your proposal specifically and i think that's also important because you know you need to either be invited or get accepted um i always think of what are the takeaways that i want my audience to you know get from my talk do i want it to be informative and eye opening of that's amazing i never knew something like this was happening or i didn't knew this technology existed or this algorithm was you know in play over here or do i want it to be actionable of i feel empowered and inspired and energized that what you replicated or you know what worked for you i want to take some of that back into my work and you know try to grow go from there so just sort of identifying what do i want the audience to feel and in an ideal world what would i want my audience members to do after the talk then you know comes with the content creation of okay you actually have the content but how do you put it in an engaging in an interactive manner so i love to have my talks being interactive because i think getting that audience engagement one keeps them you know more interested in what you're yeah. delivering helps in retaining the concepts better but it also serves as feedback for me because mm-hmm. uh, i'm the sort of person who goes on stage and who needs that audience feedback to see like you know are people like shaking yes. their heads yes. or are people like yes you're so right or yeah. are people like you know taking notes of oh my god this is amazing content like mm-hmm. i really want to remember this so i think that audience feedback uh, really comes from that interactive team that's what mm-hmm. i found um then i think just leaning into whatever your personality or whatever your style is for me it's using a lot of memes using a lot of you know comic strips using um some funny videos that's the sort of content i like and that's uh, that's just the way how i present things but i understand that's not everybody's personality or everybody's mm-hmm. style so i think just leaning into what makes you you and mm-hmm. having some of that showcase is really good because it makes the content more relatable and it also adds that level of authenticity mm-hmm. um and then i think anything uh, as in the tech industry you, things are moving so quickly so every time you know a few days before the conference i will keep it written on my slides because there will be some new publishing or you know some new uh, tool that came out or some you know another llm model that's come out so i'll have to you know quickly revise my slides and do some research mm-hmm. and put put it on that so i think that and then um just gaining a good understanding of what your audience is this is are we talking about you know beginner 101 mm-hmm. stuff are we talking about people who are very familiar with this are we talking about people who are actually individual contributors implementing all of this or is it more of leaders who you want to you know share a little more of the um insights of what goes on with their ics about so i think keeping all of these aspects in mind is usually the way i i go about preparing my technical talks That's that's pretty good. Thanks for the um good advice. I'm sure people will find it very useful. Uh and you know, speaking of technical and there is no way I won't talk about data science um because <laughs> we live in the city where even the billboards are talking about data science. Oh, 100%. Billboards are talking about generative AI, you know, art zero, this and that. I'm like, "Holy crap." Yep. Okay. <laughs> so What do you think about the evolution of data science over the past few years? 
Yeah, I think um, nobody has a perfect answer. If if mm-hmm. only we had a crystal ball, which I know it's funny, it's ironic because <laughs> we are data scientists. We are supposed to be able to predict yeah. the future. But um, I I think I've definitely started seeing instances where I would say the you know lower level task or the more repetitive automate automatable tasks are the ones where gen ai is being helpful and it's definitely a way that the productivity is getting accelerated because maybe you have you know some sort of automated data cleaning being taken care of or some sort of data aggregation and you already have you know pipelines being created so i think i haven't really seen yet a perfect end to end you know completion of the data science job but i've seen certain pockets where mm-hmm. it either is able to decrease the amount of time it takes you or at the very least even if it's not perfect it will give you a canvas or a template to start off with which mm-hmm. i think again leads to you know that time savings of hey okay this might not be 100% perfect but is it 60% 70% perfect and then i can take it from there or conversely can i give it some sort of an input and you know have it you know generate uh, either a pipeline or again a blueprint out of it so i think people are experimenting a lot i have not yet seen something that works end to end with absolutely no human intervention uh, but i do wonder what is it going to look like you know a couple of years down the line are we going to actually have things that are automated end to end will data science as a field exist i don't think huh. it's going to go away completely uh-huh. but i do feel that a lot of the duties and responsibilities will evolve now mm-hmm. what what are you know what are uh, machines or systems or computers or any sort of tools or algorithms good at they're good at automating stuff but for a data scientist there is still the tying it to business value business impact mm. there is still communicating with stakeholders and managing their expectations so i do feel that a lot of the start and ends of the pipeline that we have traditionally seen with identifying what is the problem statement you know how do you even solve that problem how do you take that business problem into an analytical problem into an engineering problem and then how do you take the you know whatever the output was whether it was an artifact or some sort of recommendations how do you convert that into actionable steps for your mm-hmm. stakeholders and then explain to them why this is happening or you know why you're recommending what you're recommending those are the parts i feel that that is more difficult to automate because you need you need that human element you need that critical thinking yes. you need to manage relationships So mm-hmm. yeah I feel like maybe you know in the next coming few years probably there'll be more focus at the ends of the pipeline and then sure the technical stuff we will have tools we will have algorithms we will have you know almost these junior data science agents helping us agents, throughout yes. the way yes yes <laughs> but again we'll see right i mean nobody can predict the future so <laughs> yeah yeah that's true do you, so uh, you know you while you were talking it that a controversial question popped up in my head do you think ai will take your job like as a data scientist or a data analyst or is it going to make it much easier or more complicated i don't know what do you think um i think just going back to what i said i feel like it's going to help in certain parts of the job mm. will it take over my job completely i don't think so because i feel as an industry our roles our responsibilities our ways of how we're defining you know our yeah. um, again our jobs is going to change is going to mm-hmm. you know switch so i yeah. feel like you just have to make sure that you know we are keeping up to date with what is expected as of of a data scientist today or an mm-hmm. ai engineer tomorrow or you know whatever it is or a researcher and making sure that we are up to date with how do we leverage these tools to make mm-hmm. us faster to make us more efficient and i i think this is something that um, a lot of people have said right a school of thought says that it's not ai that's going to replace your job it's a person who's going to use ai effectively yes. and quickly and you know efficiently yeah. so i think that is really the challenge for us is how do we keep up to date with all of those tools and technologies mm. and actually using them for our benefit if right. there's something that it can automate it can save us time great that now gives us more time to focus on gnarly problems or maybe to focus on the more human element of it or you know maybe some something else that is not uh, automatable. Mhm. Fair enough. Uh and do you think like the companies and individuals uh, are they still building those basic supervised and unsupervised models or do you think people tend to jump to building generative AI applications because it's all the hype so they want to get into that? 
Yeah, I think uh, you're probably seeing a lot of this as well. People just want to jump onto the, you know, Gen mm-hmm. AI bandwagon. Um, I know, I think I was reading this uh, joke the other day where the roadmaps for PMs are just like, Gen AI, Gen AI, Gen AI. Yeah. What does it do? Where is it helping the user? What is the outcome of it? <laughs> Question mark. But it's Gen AI. And of course, I, I'm hearing also a lot of executives um, in the industry who are pushing for, you know, yeah, competitors integrated all of this, you know, what's what's our, you know, strategy? Where and are we, uh, you know, using Gen AI? What are we using Gen AI for? So I do feel it's a little bit of uh, a hype because, because there's this constant, you know, we're almost sort of this race of who is first to market, you know, or just, you know, are you earlier than your competitors? I think we might be compromising a little bit of, is this actually genuinely helping the user? Is this a feature that is solving a user pain point or is it just like a cool to have feature that we can mm. publish, you know, in our marketing materials? I think based on like my limited view of the industry, I think we are still very much using, um, you know, your machine learning models. Because one of the issues with LLMs is also that lack of consistency, right? It's not Mm -hmm. really deterministic output or deterministic behavior. And yes, maybe a few years down the line, we'll be fine, we'll be better along with that. But how do you evaluate that output? How do you make sure it's deterministic, it's consistent, and it always gives you the same, you know, thing, no matter how many times you run it or where you run it or how you run it. So I think that is definitely a challenge that we're going to be seeing more and more as these systems go into production. And this is where people will fall back on your foundational, your supervised, unsupervised learning, because A, it's explainable. B, it costs less. You don't always need GPUs, right? <laughs> and C, if if it's good enough, right, or if it's consistent, then that's that's absolutely fine. That is what should ideally be used in a lot of these systems that um, that go live. Um, I think one one other thing that I think not a lot of people are talking about, I mean, apart from a few pockets here and there, is the data quality. We still don't have really good data quality to be able to execute the LLM systems well or to be able to train them well. So a lot of what people are envisioning is not really possible until you have good data, Mm -hmm. you have data that makes sense, you have data... You have data that's housed in so many different systems in different formats in very, you know, weird sort of schemas and tools. Maybe some of them are like legacy tools that are from 15, 20 years ago. So I think really focusing and honing in on that data quality piece is really important. So Mm -hmm. until we do that, LLMs sure might work for a few use cases, not for all of the use cases. So I personally don't think any of these foundational um, ML algorithms are anywhere to go just because of all of these reasons. Data quality. Spoken like a true data scientist, Krishma. Uh, <laughs> I, I I totally believe that if your data is not good, your algorithms, LLMs, agents are not going to do anything yep. uh, like you want. So uh, I want to ask like, you know, the, the last question before we wrap up the conversation. <clears throat> what advice would you give to the aspirational folks who want to get into data science? Mm hmm. I would say the first the first thing that always comes to my mind is just take up any project and implement it a side project an independent project an individual project um I think there's only so much that textbooks or theoretical knowledge can teach you especially in a field like computer science right you need to run into those errors on your own you need to debug that on your own you need to like assemble and you know make sure the data is in the right format and clean it on your own because with universities or even with boot camps you have these toy data sets that are clean that are pristine that's given to you and that is never the case in the real world right we've seen (laughs) how ugly some of that data can be so I think um, just taking um, taking you know um, just an independent project uh, whether that's some new tool or algorithm that you want to implement that you want to apply uh, or leverage I think that's really good and um, a bonus of it is also shows initiative when you are interviewing because everybody's going to have all of your peers will have taken the same courses or you know the same projects so what is that one factor that differentiates you is that initiative you're taking to go outside your comfort zone and learn something new so I think that that is really important and even as uh, a data scientist you need to have that curiosity of why is this happening why am I seeing it like this so that's just that curiosity and that uh, willingness to want to learn is really really important 
Um, the other thing I would say is just because so many things are evolving quickly is try your best to keep up to date. And yes, it's much easier said than done, but going for conferences, going for meetups, attending uh, talks, whether that's virtual even, um, reading papers, reading newsletters, whatever it is that you can do to keep yourself updated of the latest uh, in the field is really, really important. And start using those tools. A lot of these tools, right, they are getting going into betas or they have like, you know, free trials. Start leveraging those tools and um, see if there are any things that you would have done differently or maybe is the UX, you know, a little clunky. How would you improve that? And see if you can consolidate all of those thoughts and publish them, whether and when I say publish, it doesn't have to be like a scientific, you know, peer reviewed people. It can even be a LinkedIn post or, you know, something on X or even like a blog that you're talking about, because, again, that helps establish your credibility of, you know, hey, I know what I'm talking about. And it really hones your communication skills, which are really important for a data scientist, right? You could be the best data scientist technically in the world, but if you're not able to communicate that to your stakeholders, you're not able to explain the work that you did, you're not able to be the face of, you know, your amazing work, mm -hmm. you wouldn't really be a very successful data scientist, right? So I think okay. just that um, power skills or communication skills are really, really important. Um, so yeah, I think um, curiosity, uh, taking a project, showing that initiative, learning yourself, um, getting access to any tools, technologies you're interested in, um, attending a lot of you know these events. Uh, just, just I, I think that's that's a great start. So building your network, building your knowledge, building your confidence, building your skills. That's that's really what it comes down to. Absolutely, 100% agreed. And, you know, I'd add that, add one thing to when we were talking about projects. Move on from the Titanic and Iris data set. Move on, <laughs> yes. please. There is so much more on internet that you can find. Yes, yes. It will give you so much, much better understanding. When we started data science back then, those data sets were okay. Please move on. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes, agreed. I mean, one, you can go and scrape data. So you can, you can yes. even, you know, like go that route if you want to create your own data set. Do mm -hmm. we have data set search engines? Pick something yes. you're passionate about. Yes. Is it soccer? Is it cooking? Is it salsa? Pick a data set on that. And that's amazing because one, it will make you more engaged because you it's actually something that you care about. And two, you actually are the SME or the domain expert over there, right? So you might yes. actually understand, oh, you know, this is what it actually means when they talk about, I don't know, different positions in soccer or, you know, some other sports. So yes, yes, 100%. Please, <laughs> diversity, creative, creativity. Yes. We want to see more of that. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, wow, this was a really good conversation, Grishma. I'm sure my listeners will find it, uh, find good, you know, uh, points that you shared, not just about the communities, but also about the advice and from your experience. So uh, thanks again for sharing and coming on to my podcast. Absolutely, Sonam. Thank you so much for having me here and amazing work that you do with, you know, calling people on the podcast and just sort of, again, that empowering the community, engaging them. Love it. Such a such Thank huge you. supporter of that. Thanks so much.